Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at some problems from a book called uh, Concepts of Physics or something by H.C. Vermeer. Um, apparently it's a book used for the JE uh, test prep in India and one of my friends said that I should make a video on it so that's what I'm doing and yeah. So here's a problem from um, I think it's chapter 29 and well, there's going to be two more problems, and they're all electrostatics, and I think they're pretty interesting, so we're just going to get right into them. Number 74. Two particles carrying charges Q, uh, minus Q and plus Q and having equal masses M each are fixed at the ends of a light rod of length A to form a dipole. The rod is clamped at an end and is placed in a uniform um in an unif in a uniform electric field E with the axis of the dipole along the electric field. The rod is slightly tilted and then released. Neglecting gravity, find the time period of small oscillations. So one thing about this problem I found interesting is that I think they might have been trying to go for a different route and then um, forgot what they were doing um, in the problem and then changed the problem midway through. Because if you look at this with charges minus Q and plus Q, um, you're probably going to expect, whoops, you're probably going to expect to have two charges like this or something in the uniform magnetic field, and they're pivoted here, and they're going to be rotating because there's torque like this. Well, obviously, if it's flipped, it's not going to rotate because it won't be in stable equilibrium, and they'll just flip back here and then start oscillating. But basically, that's what a normal problem would be if there's minus Q and plus Q. But instead it's clamped at an end, which is kind of strange because it means that um, it means that basically one of these charges don't actually matter. And I thought that was kind of interesting that they changed the problem midway through. Well, I think they did. So basically, this is kind of like a pendulum. It basically is a pendulum. It's a, it's a charge pendulum in a uniform electric field rather than a uniform gravitational field which would be for a regular mass pendulum so if there's an electric field E here we can um, calculate the torque on this object and that will allow us to get the small oscillations and one of the things here is none of this matters because it's clamped as I just said which I still find kind of strange but basically let's just calculate the torque on this object um, and this is going to be theta which this is the equilibrium point and we're going to let this be a plus q charge because otherwise with this direction of ma magnetic field if this is the minus q charge it would just not be in stable equilibrium so that wouldn't work so what's the torque on this object the force on this object is like this and with magnitude eq so we can trace back and find the moment arm and that's just going to be since this is length a the moment arm is a sine theta times eq so torque is equal to EQA sine theta and we know that torque is equal to I um, alpha or I theta double dot which is I guess better here it's it looks clear and I in this case is going to be well the moment of inertia of this and the moment of inertia is just a point mass right so the moment of inertia is going to be MR squared times theta double dot is equal to EQA sine theta. Thus, um, oh, I don't know why I said r, it's not mr squared, it's ma squared, because the length is a. And so, um, solving here, basically we can just get um, it, everything in terms of theta double dot. So, theta double dot is equal to eq over ma sine theta. And the approximation we're going to make here is obviously sine theta is approximately theta. So theta double dot is equal to EQ over MA theta. And this implies that the period is equal to 2 pi root MA over EQ. And that's kind of it for this simple problem. And we'll move on to the next one. And yeah, I'm still kind of confused why they even introduced two charges but okay moving to number 24 uh, three identical metal plates with large surface areas are kept parallel to each other as shown in figure 30-e8 
The leftmost plate is given a charge Q, the rightmost a charge negative 2Q, and the middle one remains neutral. Find the charge appearing on the outer surface of the rightmost plate. So this is basically just um, multiple applications of Gauss's law. And, whoops. And what we can do here is first, and also this middle plate doesn't really matter if you think about it, but anyways, if we draw a Gaussian surface, um, going around the outside, like this, I guess. And if you look at this Gaussian surface by Gauss's law, the total flux through it is equal to negative Q over two. Epsilon naught. Wait, no, not over two. Negative Q over epsilon naught. And by symmetry, because these two sides with very large surface areas, these two will have the same flux through it as you've probably seen in many um, other problems and that gives the flux for each of these sides the flux is going to be negative q over 2 epsilon naught and same for this side too and now we're going to change our gaussian surface and we're going to draw the gaussian surface so that goes to the middle right here and the flux through that is going to be so let's let the charge on this side be qi so the total flux through that is going to be q plus q sub i over epsilon naught and we already know the flux through this side and there's going to be no fluxes to this side and on this side here um we know we know there's no flux because this is the inside of a conductor and since these are metal plates. So this is just equal to negative Q over two epsilon naught, since that's the flux through this side. And that gives us directly that Q sub I is equal to negative three Q over two. And we now we, we also know the total charge on this plate here is negative two Q is equal to Q sub I plus Q sub O, outside charge, which is what we want. And plugging our numbers in, this gives us Q sub O is equal to negative Q over 2. Alright, so that problem was also pretty simple. And let's move on to the last one, which is a little bit more involved. So this problem is, I don't know, probably from the capacitors chapter. And ignore this image here because they want 31-31, which is this one. But anyways, so consider the setup shown in figure 31-E31. The plates of the capacitor have plate area A and are clamped in the laboratory. Dielectric slab is released from rest with a length A inside the capacitor. Neglecting any effective friction or gravity, show the slab will execute periodic motion and find its time period. So with this um, setup here, it's kind of hard to analyze forces. And what we're going to do is analyze energies. Energies. So we're going to analyze the total potential energy in this system. And we're neglecting gravity. Well, actually, it doesn't even matter because it's moving horizontally. But, and we're ne neglecting friction. And so potential energy is just um, what's stored in this capacitor here. And basically, this is two capacitors one, in, um, one capacitor here and one capacitor here. And we can find the energy stored in both and just add them up. So, oh, I left that here. I don't know why. But basically, on this side, let's first find the um, capacitance of this capacitor with the dielectric. So, what's the, the capacitance of a capacitor with a dielectric is just going to be k epsilon naught times. Um, the area divided by distance because it's basically just a regular um, parallel plate capacitor with epsilon not changed and and here we can find the area is going to be a over the total area um, the total length times the area just by um, proportions right so the area is a over I assume that's an L it looks like an I times a but the distance is just D so C1 is um, that so the energy stored in here is V equals, not V, but actually, yeah, we'll use V for potential energy, um, is equal to one half times C1 times the EMF squared, 
and well, I'm not going to write that out just yet. And let's find the capacitor of this one, C2. And C2 is just equal to the same thing. Um, it's the same thing except no dielectric. And then the area is going to be this length here, which I originally wrote X, but it's just going to be L minus A over L. So L minus A over L times A over D. And the energy stored in this one is equal to one half um, C2 epsilon naught squared, not epsilon naught, EMF squared. So now we can find the total potential energy, which is equal to V1 plus V2, which is equal to one half the EMF squared over two times, let's pull some factors out of these. So we can pull out epsilon naught A over D, and we can even pull out the L, right? And then that'll leave us with for the remaining things, which is just going to be K times A plus L minus A. And we can finish here by um, trying to find an extra, trying to find the force from the potential and from the total energy. And the way we can find the force is by is by considering a, another force, whoops, by considering an e extra force, force um, with magnitude F that p pulls outward and keeps the system in static equilibrium and that'll give the exact force that this is being pulled in at. And so we can use uh, virtual work for that. So the total change and basically so there's, we'll look at the total change in energy if it's moved dx and minus f dx plus since it's negative work if it's being pulled in and we have an increase due to the battery doing work and the, what the battery does is it moves charge so that as the capacitance changes the charge the total charge stays constant and one can just calculate that since so the the work it does is dq dq times the emf and dq is equal to just dc times v times so 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 sorry not v times this so it's squared and this should be equal to dv so that all the so that the total change in energy is zero and from here um this is actually equal to DC, one half DC uh, this squared so F to pull it out is equal to the derivative derivative of this so so F is equal to Um, um, EMF squared times DC divided by 2 dx. So that's basically just equals the derivative of this, which we can just, it's pretty obvious what that is. It's going to be this. And this is not a uh, differential, it's just D times L times, and well, K minus 1 times A. Sorry, the A disappears because we're taking the derivative with respect to. Well, x or a, same thing. And so that gives us a force, and it's that means this force has to be positive to keep it in static equilibrium, which means that there's a net inward force. And basically, if that means there's a net inward force, so we can calculate how long it takes to go from here to here and multiply that by 4 to get the total period. So from here, the acceleration is equal to epsilon naught a emf squared over 2 mdl because we have to divide by mass times k minus 1 and we have this length that it has to go is l minus a so we have l minus a times 2 divided by a is equal to t squared so this gives us that t is equal to um, I guess you can just kind of do this in your head. 
the square root of 4 times L minus A times MDL over epsilon naught A EMF squared times A times K minus 1. Oops, that went off screen. So from here we just multiply that by 4 and we get the total period is equal to 8 root L minus A times MDL over epsilon naught a emf squared a times k minus one and that's going to be it for this video and thanks for watching